Thank you. The Reverend Martin Luther King is recorded as having said, everyone has the power of greatness. Not fame, not fame, but greatness. Because greatness is determined by service. Speaking from, in, uh, from within his faith tradition, Dr. King would have understood, understood the roots of these words and that they were a profoundly political statement about how power is wielded and how change occurs. To say that greatness is derived from service, service to all, is to engage in a profound cultural critique. But such an ongoing critique characterized the life of this man. Thank you for coming to the 21st annual Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration in Davis. One of the very few things we do as a public formative practice, a practice that acts not only as a reminder of a man whose words and life provided leadership in a time of great ferment in the world, but also a practice of recommitment to live in ways that honor the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King. My name is Rob Davis. I'm the mayor pro tem of Davis, and I'm thankful to have the opportunity to be with each one of you today, this day of remembrance and recommitment. I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, Dan Walk, Mayor Dan Walk, the mayor of Davis, who will be providing us with an official welcome. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much, Rob, and, and thank you for your friendship and leadership on the council. I do very much enjoy serving with you. And, Thank you very much for, for coming, everyone. I'd like to uh, throw out some more thank yous, <laughs> if you will. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ellie Fairclaw, who is here from Congressman John Garamendi's office. I'd like to thank Rui Laredo, who's here from Assemblymember Bill Dodd's office. I'd like to thank Senator Lois Wolk, former mayor Lois Wolk. Former Assembly Mayor Mariko Yamada is here as well. Uh, Supervisor Don Saylor, member of the school board uh, Barbara Archer is here. And Jesse Ortiz, who's the Yolo County Superintendent of Schools, is here as well. So give those elected officials a round of applause. For a couple others, um, no offense to the elected officials, but we have some real luminaries in our audience today. We have uh, the, uh, John Pamprin is here and Dick Holdstock is here. These are two freedom riders and real institutions in our community. And lastly, we really need to thank our Human Relations Commission for, for putting a lot of energy and putting this on and for all the other work that they do, specifically the subcommittee that worked on this. Please give them a round of applause. So I recently gave a speech, as some of you may know, in which I implored our community to renew Davis and renew our commitment to the ideals that made our community what it is today. And I'd like to see that uh, I think that applies in this context as well. And I'd really like to use this opportunity now, this is the 21st year that we're doing this, to renew our commitment to this event and really renew our uh, you know, commitment to the ideals upon which this event was founded and, and of course, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because even though we are in our 21st year of celebrating this event, uh, we still have a long ways to go to reach that mountaintop that Dr. King spoke about in his final speech in Memphis. One out of every four persons in California lives in poverty. We've got staggering inequality in California and throughout the nation, and we've got significant racial disparities in our country. So these challenges still remain, and I think it's really important to use this opportunity to you know, re-inject energy into that movement, the ideals uh, upon which this event really was founded, and I see that happening in two ways. First is really what the theme of this particular event is, and that's service. I have always viewed this day as a day of service. I think it's critical that everyone sees this day as not just about coming to this event and, 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 and talking about these issues and then getting energized here, but taking that energy and really applying it uh, you know, outside of the confines of this theater and really make this day about a day of service. But more than that, make it about a day of service, not just for today, but for the 364 other days of the year. And I think that's really critical. 
it's really, again, what this community is based upon. It's why, this, why we've had this event, and it's really what I hope that everyone takes away from this event. So again, thank you very much on behalf of the City of Davis. I welcome everyone here, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Dr. King also said, and it was on the screen earlier, you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. And we might add, all you need is a willingness to share the gifts you have, to bring them to the table of service, place them there so that all can partake. We have several people today who willingly bring their gifts to share with us. I want to introduce James Williams, who is going to remind us that while we have come a long way in our celebration of equal rights, we have a long way to go. With his vocal rendition of A Change is Going to Come, please join me in welcoming Mr. James Williams. my original concept. Very good. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. I was, I'm a little embarrassed to say this is my first Martin Luther King Day celebration in Davis, but as I am soon to be 10 years in Davis, hey, better late than never. See if I can read this. A change is going to come. I was just about 12 years old when Sam Cooke released uh, the B side of one of his many big hit 45s. The A side, can anybody remember? Provocative title of Shake. All right. Now, I have to stop right here and uh, make a reference to those in our audience today who may not have any knowledge of the little vinyl discs, the 45 <laughs> RPM, two-sided, uh, as you would say, uh, MP3, okay? <laughs> Just three minutes to make the magic happen, which Sam Cooke always did. But even though Sam Cooke was at the height of his powers as a songwriter, it was not the intention of RCA Victor for this to be anything more than, well, filler, and uh, maybe a modest success. Um, certainly not a piece of black history. Um, in a very simple and direct way, the scope of the African American experience is brought sharply into focus. The song, inspired by his personal life experiences in the Jim Crow segregated American South, speaks of the struggle and of his hope for a better time to come. You can hear in, hear in it the historical perspective of one already once removed from the darkest of times, but also with the knowledge that there is still a very long way to go. A Change is Gonna Come was destined to be an anthem for the American Civil Rights Movement and widely considered Sam Cooke's best composition, hailed as culturally, historically, as well as aesthetically it's a very poppy mic, so we're going to try it. 
I was born by the river in a little tent just like that river I've been running ever since it's been a long a long time coming but I know oh, oh, change is gonna come it's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die, cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change is gonna come. Oh. I go to the movies, or I go downtown. Oh, somebody's always saying, don't you hang around. Oh, 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 I go to my brother. I say, brother, help me, please. But I find myself back down on my knees. Oh, there were times that I thought I wouldn't last for long. But now I have, I find I have the strength to carry on. It's been a long time coming, but I know change is gonna come. Yes, it's been a long, a long time coming. But I know change is gonna come. Yes, it Thanks, James. And that's the way gifts work. I kind of wish I had that gift, actually. <laughs> you know, uh, people often ask, how can I best be involved in, fill in the blank, helping my community, um, serving those in need, resolving conflict, working with youth? And I find that the question is often motivated by a fear. Fear on, on the part of the person asking the question, uh, do I really have anything special to bring? Do I really have anything special to bring? My experience here and around the world is that we must see our community. We must see our community as a body. Not everyone is a hand. Not everyone is an eye. Not everyone is the heart. But just as no part of the body can choose to act on its own, so we in this community need the contribution of all parts. Bring your gift. Our next performance is by a person who has not only used his gifts to provide leadership through, throughout Yolo County, particularly in the environmental realm, he's also a talented singer and songwriter. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Clarence Van Hook, who will be sharing two songs with us today. caught him wearing his pants below down there like they do it. <laughs> so. I, uh, this little song I wrote, I love it, is We Are Family. 
we're all God's children. And so I think, I, I, I did this recording in uh, Johnny Otis's studio. Some of you may know Johnny Otis. And, okay, anyway, uh, I, I did this in Johnny Otis's studio and uh, then he passed on. And uh, so I'm still, I went on and produced it, but I don't have uh, a uh, recording label. <laughs> So anyone out there, we'll put this out because I think it's appropriate right now. It ought to be playing all over the world because we are family. And, and, and it, well, I'll just, listen, the chorus goes like this, and you, you can join me and we'll, we'll sing it. We are family. We're all God's children, you see. For he's our redeemer. He loved us so much that he gave up his son to redeem us as such. So we are family. We're all God's children, you see. And then before we break up, we'll sit down and make up and stay a family let's do that chorus one more time we are family we are family we're all god's children you see we're all god's children you see before we break up we'll sit down and make up before we break up we'll sit down and make up and stay a fan that's it one more time let's do the chorus we are family we are family you got it we're all God's children, you see. Before we break up, before we break up, we'll sit down and make up and stay a fan. I'll do another verse. <coughs> we a family. We're all God's children, you see. For liberty and justice and freedom for all. Together we must stand, or divided we fall. Everybody, we are family. Ah, we're all God's children, you see. And I say before we break up, we'll sit down and make up and stay a fan. One more time. We are family. We I said before we break up, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna make up and stay a family. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get the, get that get the lyrics printed out maybe and pass it out. And, and uh, <clears throat> this is a a song that kind of refers to Martin. It's, it's a little little prayer. What will I leave behind? And I uh, I think we all concern ourselves at some point or another about what we want to leave. The fact that you're here means that you. Uh, you want to make a difference. And so you want to leave something behind. You want to leave a good name and good deeds. So this, this song goes, and you can sing this along with me too. <laughs> uh, it, the chorus goes like this. Leave behind, yes, leave behind. What will I leave behind? After I leave for a world unknown, tell me what will I leave behind? One more time, leave behind. Leave behind. Yes, leave behind. What will I leave behind? What will I leave? After I leave for worlds unknown. After I leave. Forward unknown, 
Tell me what will I leave behind? One more time, leave behind, yes, leave. Leave. Sing it out, y'all. What will I leave behind? After I leave for worlds unknown. What will I leave? What will I leave me? I'll do a verse. This is my prayer, oh Lord, today. Let me be whole, holy thine. And after I'm called from earth away, what will I leave? Be behind. Come on, the chorus now. Leave behind, yeah, leave behind. What will I leave? What will I leave behind? Oh, and then after I leave, gotta go to world unknown. Tell me, will I leave behind? I like this verse. Will I be missed by the ones that I love? Or have I been unkind? And have I been true to my God up above? Tell me what will I leave behind? Leave behind? Leave. Come on, y'all. Leave behind. I want to know what will I leave. I leave behind. Well, and then after I leave, gotta go to world unknown. Tell me what will I leave behind. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thanks, Clarence. You may know that today is, is also National Martin Luther King Day of Service, and the theme of it is it's a day on, not a day off. As Dan alluded to in his talks, of course, we know that service can and must be extended beyond this day. Indeed, when it comes to service, there's no day off. To really help us think about service and the different forms it can take in our community, we have a special panel today moderated by the co-chair of the Davis Human Relations Commission, David Greenwald. I'm going to ask David to start making his way up here. And the panelists as well, which I'll introduce, uh, whom I'll introduce one at a time. We are privileged to have three panelists to share their experiences and stories. First, we have Clarence Van Hook, who just shared with us, in addition to his obvious singing talents, He's a, Gin a Gwinda farmer, has been active in several efforts, including with the Western Yolo Grange. So come on up and have a seat, Clarence. We have Ciara Main. You can learn more about Ciara here. Uh, Ciara is, um, has been a driving force locally with the Get on the Bus program. And then the third panelist is Robin Dewey. Uh, Robin has played a leading role with promoting. Go ahead, give a, give a round. Robin clearly brought family members today, um, <laughs> leading role with <laughs> promoting and sustaining Team Davis Special Olympics. So with that, we'll invite David to come up and lead our panelists in a discussion. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is great to see a packed audience here. Um, so um, we have uh, a lot of questions and a limited time, so I'm going to um, cut uh, these questions off precisely at two minutes. Uh, so answer the question. Uh, I'll cut you off. Don't be offended, and we'll just uh, move down the row because uh, we got about half an hour to do five questions. Um, so um, we're going to start uh, with uh, Robin on the end. Uh, so the first question is. 
Uh, why do you think it was important to Dr. King to call the community to service? Well, I guess I, I really feel like it's the only way to really get to know people who are different from you and to embrace diversity, which makes our community so much richer. And I feel like you can't really embrace diversity unless you are side by side being with, with people who are different uh, and learning from them. Um, and, uh, you know, it just makes the community much stronger and your own lives much richer. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you all for being here. This is my first as well, and I'm super excited to be here. Um, I believe, oops, excuse me, that the community, like we've already talked about, is the body. And so bringing and calling your body parts to then fulfill its main duty and its main principles are the number one thing that King needed to do. And to call them and to understand the motivation and the principles that we needed to fulfill in order to get to where we need to get to. And then we have all these wonderful people in here today that also fulfill this body. And then we have common ground and common mind in order to fulfill that legacy, to continue on this community and to continue on our goals and our successes. See, whenever I tell people I'm holding them to two minutes, they never go to two minutes. <laughs> it's hard. Go ahead, Clarence. You just wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, I was uh, born in Arkansas. Uh, and I brag about it now. I'm very proud of, of my age. So you have to, people get tired of hearing me tell them I'll, I'll be 83 in April. <laughs> yeah, so, and, I, and I'm, I'm proud of it. I was born in 1932, right back in the day when, when civil rights didn't exist. And so I, I had an opportunity to, to, to learn and to experience, and I, I know what I'm talking about. I can tell my grandkids and, they, and try to help them to grasp it. And so I, uh, I think Dr. Martin Luther King was doing a great service. One of the things that, he, well, he was a Baptist minister. And so being, being called to preach, that was his mission. And so that was it in a nutshell. I mean, he, he, had no, he, he, he was ordained to go out and to serve. And as, the, um, as this scripture reads, you serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul. And so you serve your fellow man. And, and, and that's what he was, that's, what he, that's the message he was carrying. So um, I had a, he was assassinated on my birthday, April 4th. And I had an opportunity to meet him, and as, as I, but I didn't get as close to him as I would have as I, if I had known, but you don't know. So, and you don't make friends because of the, who they are in a way, but, but uh, you know, you, you would like to, Muhammad Ali used to beg me to come to Louisville to go to the Kentucky Derby with him and all. And so I never did. And now I regret it. And, and, and I would, I, I want to go visit him, but they say they won't let people come. But he and I were close. Uh, all right, Clarence, I got to cut I you off. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to start uh, with, with Sierra this time. Uh, how does service promote diversity in communities? So, um, how does it support, how does diversity support? How does service support, support diversity in communities? Well, just like Robin was saying, um, it brings people of different cultures together and it allows responsiveness from other people to then bring forth something that could, they can contribute, like their gifts, or they have particular um, goals that everyone is aligned to then get to the same exact, same exact goal. Um, my experience with, I've, I grew up in San Luis Obispo County, or Santa Barbara County, excuse me, and so 
I've also grew up in this age. And so I've had to learn what, I've had to actually live in a more diverse situation than maybe most of you in this audience have. And so I have developed working with other people and collaborating with other people and seeing the better good. And I cannot say that I lived through the awesome days, <laughs> right? I cannot say that I've experienced and actually witnessed moving from one point to the next and seeing the tremendous change that has happened. And all that I know is that me being at this university now and the diversity in the communities that we have on campus and we're trying to hold on to this authentic view, I guess you can call it, has been a tremendous privilege. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Clarence, how does uh, service promote diversity in communities? Um, by coming together, service, when, you, when you're working like on a, such as this, an event such as this, you get to fellowship and to meet one another. You know, uh, Martin, one of it, and I, I, I use it a lot, but I don't put it in the order that he, he said it, but, but Martin said that one of the reasons we don't get along is because we don't trust each other, we don't know each other, the reason we don't trust each other is because we don't know each other, and the reason we don't know each other is because we don't fellowship with each other, mm -hmm. and so on. So this, the service organizations that uh, I'm, I'm a member of a Baptist church, and we do outreach, and we try to feed the, you know, the, the hungry and help the homeless find shelter, as our supervisors do, and others in, the, you know, it's service. And that's how it brings us together. When we see each other trying to help someone, help do, you know, that, that makes us come closer. We then know that if this person has a caring heart and he feels the way he does about this person and he's going out of his way to do this, then he's gotta be a decent person. So then you don't have that, you lose that fear. Yeah. Then you kinda, but you need to talk. You need to come get, yeah. hey, mm -hmm. I talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's one of the things that I think Martin espoused, and and the and the the, the scriptures. And he was a minister. I'm not, but he um, by love serve one another, yeah. and and, you know, and and it said that in all the law, that it says love one another and love thy neighbor as thyself. So. So if we do those things, then you know we we got it kind of covered and. As we do our services, it inspires Thank you, us. Clarence. <laughs> okay, Robin, uh, how does service promote diversity in communities? Well, I think um, Clarence and Ciara have, have really sort of de defined that. So I thought what I would do is just take a second to um, explain what Team Davis is and does and how it has affected some of the lives of our volunteers which is, it's, a, it's our Special Olympics team in town, but we do many more things. We have nine sports, we offer art classes, singing classes, dances, nutrition classes, et cetera. Um, but our primary, primary goal is community integration so that our participants uh, fully feel included and a part of our community. Um, and we, we have uh, about 150 participants, their families, et cetera, and we have about 90 volunteers, and we're all volunteer. And what we hear from college students and, and um, high school students time and time again who volunteer on a regular basis, that they have, it's changed their lives, that they've changed career paths, et cetera, just because they have been with people who are different from them and have learned from them and embraced, uh, embraced the differences. And so I think that's what you get from uh, real community service. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, third question before this thing goes off. Um, and we'll start with Clarence this time. Uh, what have you found most challenging about participating in community service and most rewarding? I have found that time, time is the most challenging to, to find the time 
Um, I'm such a busy guy. And so, but uh, the, um, if you can find the time to get involved and do what's needed, I think you find many people out there, there are many good Samaritans out in, in the community that would be more than happy to help work with you on, on uh, doing something. I do a multicultural event. It changed. It started as a black history up in Gwenda, and, and I want to have some flyers out there in the hallway. So pick one up and then come and join me because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the word out and, and you know, expose history that, that, that's not known and bring us together to fellowship. So the, the hardest thing is find the time and then the other thing is to, to be motivated. Because if you can, if you go out and and start doing something, <clears throat> this was a challenge to me to, to put this event on. But but with God's help and with the help of my friends and all, it works. <laughs> so come on down. <laughs> Thank you. Um, back to Robin. Uh, what have you found most challenging about participating in community service, and what is most rewarding? Um, well. Personally, but I think I can speak for our other volunteers. What's most rewarding is the richness um, uh, that I feel of my life, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the embracing a community. I have a, I have several communities, but Team Davis is a very, very important one to me, um, and so I feel like, you know, that's probably for me and the other volunteers the most rewarding. Um, what's challenging is uh, making sure that everyone feels included, including our volunteers. And sometimes uh, what can be hard for new volunteers is to, um, to come into a situation where things are very unfamiliar and people are unfamiliar and people's actions are unfamiliar. And I think it's important for um, volunteer, long-time volunteers then to make sure that new volunteers feel included and um, know how to begin working with, with, our, with our group. Um, so I don't know if I answered the question, but something like that. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, uh, Sierra. Um, so I am a part of a program called Get on the Bus, where we reunite children with their mothers and fathers who are incarcerated. And so we serve a Folsom uh, Prison and Solano uh, locally at UC Davis, um, but we go all across the state. And so my challenge that has been over and over again in terms of m me serving have been recruiting people who have the same drive and understanding that we are serving the children in this and finding people who understand that stigma that is floating around in this controversial situation. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is the logistical challenge, I guess, but the biggest challenge for me personally is not getting all of these children the opportunity to see their parents because it is very difficult for people to get from point A to point B, and that is all we provide. And we go to 13 to 20 prisons each year. And it's heartbreaking. Um, in that being said, it is a privilege to be even a part of something that is spectacular. I will just go in on my like, program because I love it so much and I, I'm just so thankful that it is actually happening. It started in 2000 and we are, it's 2015, oh my goodness. <laughs> and it has just blossomed and we serve so many uh, prisons and parents, we reunite families and that is the most amazing thing that I could ever do. And even though we have limited volunteers and it's just hard for me to just give it up, I just can't. So I guess that's another challenging part, <laughs> I just can't give it up. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will go now uh, to Robin to start the fourth question. Uh, why is the mission of the organization you serve important to you? 
Well, I, I think we've talked a lot about what um, what's important and that this is a population, the population we serve, those with intellectual and, and physical disabilities uh, in Davis is, is often, like other sort of vulnerable uh, minority populations, is often invisible and feels misunderstood and is not accepted. Um, and so uh, it's important, as I said, our, our, our mission is, is to increase the community integration so that we can increase understanding. And I'll just say that um, Davis actually has a long history of trying to do this with, with um, our population, starting with the school system, which was um, the, some of the first full inclusion programs were started in Davis. Our city alternative <coughs> recreation program is a model. Uh, across the country. Um, we have UC Davis Best Buddies uh, chapter on campus that was awarded the best chapter in the state, um, which is, puts to, uh, college kids together with people with disabilities. We have an autism awareness program on campus. Um, UC Davis chose this year for uh, to pick Temple Grandin's book as the campus book project. Temple Grand Grandin is um, the most famous person with autism in the country and her, her speech, which is gonna be at the Mondavia, is almost sold out. So I think we have a lot to be really proud of um, here in Davis, but I also feel like we have a long way to go. And so that's our, our mission. Um, so when, when people um, uh, criticize folks for coming to movie theaters and making noises when they are, um, la other people are laughing and make them feel bad uh, when they, when people use the R word um, just sort of indiscriminately and with, without you know, thought, like my hairdresser did recently, that's not acceptable and we have a long way to go to, to fix those things here in Davis. Thank you, and I think that's kind of the theme for the day. Lots of progress, but a long way to go. Uh, Sierra? You mind repeating the question? Uh, sure, sorry. Um, why is the mission of the organization you serve important to you? Oh, I kind of touched on that the last question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess, you, yeah, <laughs> right. I guess uh, personally, my father was incarcerated, so my heart is, it has me, I, basically. And so um, I went through my long-term childhood of not having my father in my life. And I just can't bear the thought of any child going through that in terms of um, also, I, I kind of see it in, in children's eyes. I, I have a heart for youth, if you can tell. But um, I feel that the youth are so powerful and that they are just these seeds ready to blossom up. Yeah, all of you, little ones in the front, <laughs> you are all ready to blossom up into these great leaders, and that's where it starts. Um, I think five years old, you, you, you're, you're ready to just go out and be exploratory and say, I like this, I like that, and I want to be this great endeavor. And I had dreams like that when I was little, and I believe that each child can't be told no. Don't, don't go to your parents now and say, no, don't do that, that's not what I'm saying, but <laughs> definitely strive to do whatever you want to do. Wear whatever you want to wear, as long as the parents say it's okay. And, <laughs> but be creative, and I, I really love that in our youth. Um, discipline, yet just creativity is something that I would love to see these kids just grow up in. And, just rock the world, because we need that. We definitely need it. 2015, we need it this year. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll add real quickly that I see all these uh, little kids yeah. uh, sitting out in the audience behaving so well and uh, sitting so patiently, so thank you. Clarence, why is the mission of the organization you serve important to you? Well, it's uh, Greater Second Baptist Church in <laughs> Woodland, California, on 2nd and Main. You're all invited to come, 11 o'clock on Sunday. 
and we, we, we worship. We go in there and, and praise the Lord, and then we, uh, we feed on Saturdays. We, we, have a, we take people in and feed them, and then it is known. I heard one young lady say in the church, we were talking about the finances, and she was saying that, well, one thing that I've heard out on the streets, um, and people say, uh, if you ever need any money uh, for food or whatever you need, just go down there to Second Baptist and they'll give you, they'll, they'll just give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and so some thought that may not be good, but I thought it was good that, you know, if you have it, uh, why not, you know, and let them come. And so um, the church, it does a lot of good things, and, and I think that it is worthy of... Uh, Support. I also, I belong to, I'm a joiner in a way. I've helped to found two or three organizations, uh, Rotary, uh, Bayview Hunters Point Rotary, and I'm a member, uh, not so active member, but I do go to the meetings of the Luna Vista Rotary here in Woodland. And the motto of the Rotary is service above self. And I, I, I think that's a good, a good motto. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, a gentleman in the community where I live said about the Methodist Church, he was a member, and I, I joined, I was lay leader in, in Gwenda for a while. And he, uh, he says, Clarence, I tell you one thing about this Methodist organization. They send a lot of money overseas over there to Africa. <laughs> and so that means that they were doing some good things to help. So that, th those, that makes me proud to be a part of those kind of service organizations. We're running a little ahead. That's why I didn't cut anyone off. <laughs> Thank you. All right. One more question. Uh, we'll start with Sierra. Um, what do you think is the biggest barrier for people to participate in community service outside of time? Oh, uh, <laughs> the biggest barrier. I feel we've touched on a lot of our kind of mm -hmm. barriers that we've faced personally. Um, time, time is definitely <laughs> that. Uh, I guess the biggest barrier. Hmm. Um, I would have to just go back to uh, getting passionate people or, or I guess maybe the biggest barrier is to continue the progression. The, you start off and you're ready to go, right? You're like, yeah, we got all these fun people and we're excited and we're going to help children or serve like get people in and feed them and all this stuff and then the momentum kind of dies. <laughs> and I think that's the biggest, it's a barrier. It's a barrier that's always there and it's about con constantly jumping that barrier and the barrier can come in all shapes and sizes but something always blocks your momentum. And then getting that strive to just get back up again and say, all right, let's just keep on going. Let's just keep on going. Funding's not there. Okay, we're gonna keep on going. Volunteers aren't there, let's keep on going. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm gonna keep on going. <laughs> and so, and that's where I'm at right now a little bit, but it's okay. Um, I'm just gonna keep on preaching this lovely organization because I don't want it to die. It's my baby. Oh, that's a big barrier too. Making it your baby and not being able to nurture it the way it needs to be nurtured. That's, that's probably the biggest barrier. But. Please, you can always talk to me afterwards um, about how, if you're all doing organizations or something like this, and you're trying to get your little wheels turning, I would think any of us would be willing to sit down and talk to you for a couple of minutes. We're definitely willing, so thank you. Thank you. I, I think I speak for a lot of people. <laughs> By the time you know what you're doing, it's time to hang it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Clarence, what's the biggest barrier outside of time? Um, you know, I think it's uh, motivation, motivation. And like I was saying about my church, the church kind of tends to motivate. We go into the church and we sing, and of course we, we have a good musical celebration and, and lifting him up. And, and then we, and I like to say, now go out and serve. And, 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 and those people, the members of the church, 
I think they get motivated. That's what the church should be about, is motivating us to love one another, to serve one another. And this scripture, I, I had some scriptures that I was going to, but we ain't having church today. But <laughs> come, to, come to Second Baptist some Sunday. Anyway, the, 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 the motivation is what I think is missing in some ways. And I don't quite know how, um, how there's some brains here. And uh, think about it. I, I would like to find a way. I thought, I thought maybe if people who are working in organizations like the Rotary and, and other organizations who are helping others like you doing, you're doing that, and it's obvious. You should be tax exempt. They shouldn't be, the IRS shouldn't even have your social security number. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Those numbers. So, oh. so, so let's, let's think about that. Why not? Because that's a better way to motivate, to serve the welfare of others. And so, of course you don't need, we do it because I don't need anything. Yeah. I love doing it. And the joy I didn't tell you about, I just get a joy out of seeing the, the results of what I have done to help someone, mm -hmm. to help. I'm a contractor and I ha have several young men that I helped get into the electrician's union and helped to get into the, to the uh, labor union and all that, I helped them. And what blesses my heart is sometimes I see them and they say, Mr. Van Hook, how, how you doing? I'm Harry, you know, you, you helped me get in the union, you remember me? That, that's what I do it for, and in a way, I do it because I have the empathy, and my religion says do it. But anyway. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> All right, Robin, you get the last word. Biggest barrier outside of time. Okay, um, well, as you two were talking, I was sort of thinking about how lucky we are that in Team Davis that we have some really long-term volunteers who have programs, they run with those programs, and so I think one of the challenges is making sure that your, your group is organized so that it's not just one person doing everything or two people, it's several people that really feel responsible for that organization and, and can run with it. And so that's one challenge, and that I feel like has really actually been working really well with, with our group. Uh, we feel very lucky about it. Um, and I think another challenge besides time is uh, new volunteers will come to us and say, well, I don't really, ha and I'm thinking about what Rob said and what Dan said, I don't really have anything to offer, you know, I'm interested, but I don't have a, you know, I don't have skills at a particular sport or art or whatever, and how am I gonna fit in? And the reality is, that doesn't matter. If you've got the right attitude, mm -hmm. and you care, yeah. and you're understanding, yeah. and you're willing to learn and be with a diverse group of people, then this, you know, our organization, I think any of the organizations represented here, you know, that's all you need. And so the last thing I would also say is that even if you don't have time to actually put in to volunteer, everybody has a role to play out in the community to be understanding of people with differences, to be accepting and to speak up when, when you see an injustice among anybody that is different from you. And so I think it's really, really important that we all embrace what Dr. King was calling us to do and, and do that very thing. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like to thank our panel very much for their participation. <laughs> we killed the mic. <laughs> All right, look forward to hearing what the Reverend Malone has to say in a few minutes here. Well, it's evident from, well, let's give him another round of applause as we sit down. I mean, we, know, we know it. We know that, that service um, can take many forms. Um, you, Robin, Sierra, Clarence, um, you're part of a body, of a community of witness. Martin Luther King talked about the beloved community. It doesn't spring from the earth. It's a community of witness, it's a community of action, of persistence and commitment. So thank you for your examples. And thank you for your leadership. Next, uh, we're in for a special treat as we listen to the captivating voice of Ms. Natalie Minya. Ms. Minya is a motivational speaker, an entrepreneur, a designer, a singer. The list goes on. Today she'll sing for us. 
Uh, Ms. Minya strongly believes that everyone is here for a purpose and should find and can find their potential in service to others. Um, oh, it's on. <laughs> All right. um, the spiritual I'm about to sing today, uh, was the lyrics of it was written by John Newton, a famous, in the, in the, at the time, slave owner. And history has it that he was inspired to write these lyrics when his ship, which was transporting slaves from Africa, was about to capsize and he, 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 had, he was inspired to sing these words. The fascinating thing is that the books say, lyrics, John Newton, melody, unknown. And many theorists believe that he heard the sound and the melodies from the slaves down below singing as they also were in fear of their lives. I find this very interesting, this theory, because as a person born in Zimbabwe, Africa, I know when times are tough, all we can do is sing those chants or those hymns that bring us closer. I can imagine during that time, they probably sang something like, and many other funeral songs. But, however, whatever the theory might be, we may never know, I find that this song that is sung all over the world, a song written by a slave owner, something that was meant to divide the world, has come to unite us as a people. The song is sung all around the world, primarily by African Americans, Africans, Europeans, you name it, people of all tribes and colors. And if there's anything I can think of dedicating to a person who stood for unity, for the world, a world hero, it is Martin Luther King. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I am found was blind but now I see Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers toils and snares we to 
Jeremy, the last one. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. keynote speaker today is the Reverend Tim Malone. Reverend Malone is a longtime Davis resident, founder of the regional Martin Luther King Jr. Scholarship Program, which has provided thousands of scholarship dollars to college students. He's provided campus ministry for UC Davis for years and was previously the director of the Broderick Christian Center in West Sacramento. Service is integrated into everything he does and everything that he lives. Join me in welcoming the Reverend Tim Malone. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me, mold me, <coughs> hold me, use me. Let me be an instrument for peace and justice with the power of love. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be with you today. as we reflect on a historical giant, a man whom I did not get the opportunity to meet, but a man who nevertheless profoundly affected my life and the lives of many people, not only in the United States, but all over the world. It is a great privilege and honor to be here with many of the distinguished people in our audience, the movers and shakers in this community, who has outreach that affects people everywhere. If I started to name names, they would be too many to mention, but you know who you are, and I thank you for being here. When I was a a child, a young man. My father never hunted. He wouldn't fish. He wouldn't kill anything. He was not a vegetarian, but he, he could not kill anything. And I asked him, I said, Dad, why? He said, son, I fought in World War II. I was in Patton's all-black tank battalion. They sent us out on some very, very tough assignments. Some of them actually were suicide missions. He almost died three times. 
He was coming back from the war. To Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the north. And the buses were not segregated in the north. And he was on a bus in full uniform. There were two seats left. And a young white woman and her little daughter came in the bus. And the white woman took the seat across from him and there was a seat next to him. And the little girl hesitated to sit down next to him. And the mother said, honey, sit down, take the seat. No! Please, honey, sit down, take that seat. No! I said, honey, would you please sit down and take that seat? I'm not sitting next to that nigger. And the mother was embarrassed. And my dad's heart sank. He said from that moment on, he was never the same. He realized that he was fighting really the wrong war. The freedom that he fought for for those in Europe, he did not have in his own country. And he became an activist. And the swimming pool that I swam in, he told me a story that when he got back to Pittsburgh, that particular public pool was a white-only pool. And he got involved with some activists, and he was the first African-American ever to swim in that pool. They had to have guards to let him get in to swim and guards for him to come out. My father was never the same. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. grew up in an extremely violent and segregated environment. He grew up in a world where black lives meant nothing. Constant indignities, colored drinking fountains, white drinking fountains. If they went to the store, they couldn't try on clothes. They faced Jim Crow laws. They couldn't vote. They were second-class citizens, had to give up their seats on buses. And when he was a little boy, there was a family across the street, a man, a white family that owned a store near them. And they used to go over and play with their sons who were white, him and his brother and maybe even his sister. But one day he went over to play with his friends and his father, they weren't, they, his father wouldn't let him play with Martin and his brother A.D. And Martin couldn't understand. So he came back upset and he went to his mother. He said, we've been playing with them all along, Mom. What, what's going on? She said, Martin, some people don't treat others fairly. Martin Luther King looked at him, looked up at her and said, Mama, one day I'm going to change this. So Dr. Martin Luther King was a brilliant student. He uh, grew up under Daddy King, who was a profound impact, but the most, the strongest impact on, on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was his father, Daddy King. Now I did meet Daddy King, and I'll never forget the experience. He was uh, sitting outside his church, uh, eating some peanuts, and uh, we all approached him. We surrounded him, Daddy King, Daddy King. And I, I looked at him, and we took a picture with him. I said, Daddy King, can I have your autograph? He said, what you want it for? I said, Daddy King, you're, you're, you're famous. He said, where are you from? I told him I was in the Bay Area then. I was in uh, graduate school in Berkeley, California. He said, yeah, that's right across the bridge from San Francisco. I've been there, a great place. So he politely signed it, and uh, we went on our way. But Daddy King was a strong man. Daddy King was active in his community. Daddy King stood up for the rights. I remember the story of, of Martin going into a store to, 
the, the, the try on some shoes and the, and the man wouldn't let him try them on and Daddy King took his son and, and took him out of that store. I remember when Daddy King, the story of Daddy King was stopped by the police for whatever reason and the police called him boy and Daddy King pointed at Martin Luther King Jr. said, you see that? That young man, that's a boy. I'm a man. The police officer was so shocked by it that he didn't give him a ticket and rode off. <laughs> Daddy King was strong. And here he was sitting outside of his church. Now, a lot of people don't realize that when Daddy King was supposed to preach one Sunday, there was a man that came in who intended on killing Daddy King at the church. This was after Martin Luther King was assassinated. In this deranged, sick, black man came in and shot Mrs. King and a deacon and killed both of them. But Daddy King was undeterred. There he was sitting out front of the church. Now to be a member of the King family is, is an awesome burden, even now. Just their very name evokes power. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when he was young, when he just started out, and Montgomery and led the bus boycott. He was in Montgomery and he was a young preacher. He had his, earned his PhD, he was married. Uh, he had his wife and a young baby, Yolanda King. And uh, Rosa Parks on December 1st, 1955, refused to give up her seat. And the bus boycott, they were thinking about it. They wanted to have a meeting and they asked Dr. King if he would lead it. He said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be involved with this. He was no fool, that was a dangerous mission. And uh, then Dr. King thought about it. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll attend the meeting. They said, that's good because the meeting's at your church. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. King eventually and reluctantly accepted the leadership of the Montgomery Improvement Association and led the bus boycott. Not long after the leadership, a few months later, or maybe less than a month even, his house was bombed and Coretta was there with Yolanda. And a crowd of angry men and women gathered around the house and they brought their guns They said, we're not gonna let them get away with this. We're gonna fight fire with fire. And Dr. King courageously and bravely stood out front and said, no, we worship Jesus. And Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. He told Peter, who had the sword of those who came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, who had swiped off the ear of a soldier, Peter, put up your sword. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. That's the God we serve. A newspaper man recorded it, and the people slowly left, took their guns back home, and thus began the nonviolent civil rights movement of the modern era. Now, I couldn't imagine. Dr. King had almost 50 death threats a day. Can you imagine? Phone calls. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your wife. I'm going to kill anybody around you. He lived under the threat of death for 13 years, from the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott until he was assassinated on April the 4th, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee. Amazing pressure. The FBI followed him wherever he went once Bobby Kennedy gave J. Edgar Hoover the authority. Now, Bobby Kennedy, in his defense, gave J. Edgar Hoover limited authority to tap King. He shouldn't have given it to him at all. It wasn't LBJ as in the movie Selma, but it is a great movie. It was Bobby Kennedy. But J. Edgar Hoover took that power as he did with everything and gave himself unlimited. And he had the FBI watching King like a hawk falling around, taping everything. Even got to the point where they sent a letter to Mrs. King 
on some of King's indiscretions and told him, you know what you have to do right now, Martin, wanting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to commit suicide. In the face of the threats, in the face of the violence, people getting killed, the four little children that died in the in church bombing, Medgar Evers was assassinated, Malcolm X was assassinated, James Reeve was killed, Vida Luezo was killed, people were dying around him all the time, they even shot John Kennedy. King knew that he was going to die. And when I look back on history and I've studied it, the most amazing thing was not that he was assassinated, the most amazing thing that he lived for 13 years under the threat of death. Think about it right now. In America, no one is safe. We have guns everywhere. Some idiot can come in right now and shoot all of us. Our laws allow that. The young men that shot those people in the, in, in the movie theater in Colorado bought all kinds of guns, was facing problems, mental challenges. But yet these companies ship ammunition after ammunition. He bought all kinds of guns. That's the laws that we still have in this country, and it's insane. Yeah. Now, you know if it can happen now. If that can happen right now, you know how easy it was for them to kill Dr. King back then. The, uh, people don't realize that after, Dr., uh, after uh, Malcolm X was assassinated, the tremendous pressure that was placed on King. People don't realize that when he died, a lot of people, I should say, don't realize that when he died, he was not a hero. King was hated. And this is the thing that we need to understand about religion. And I'll specifically speak about Christianity since that is my faith. And as a Baptist minister, I understand the tradition of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In the black Baptist church, there is no more important place than the pastor of that church than black Baptist ministers. They are the kings, they are the princes, they are the part of royalty to be respected. But the other thing that's important is that we are looked upon to speak up for the people in our community. We are to be the voice. We are to be the strength. We're to stand up for the oppressed, for the poor. That's our job. And Daddy King fulfilled that role, and Martin Luther King even took it to a higher level. He not only spoke up for black folks and African Americans, he spoke up for the poor. He spoke up for those in Vietnam that were being killed indiscriminately by our bombs. He spoke out against materialism. He spoke up for poor whites who had fallen under the illusion that they were better than us because they were white, but they were treated the same way. So King was a threat. And the most serious thing happened when he, when he went out and, and spoke against the Vietnam War. We have a man here that, that talked to King and, and told him, also asked him to speak out against the Vietnam War. Well, all kinds of people were speaking out against the Vietnam War. That was on April 4th, 1967. Very important date. I'm sorry. April 4th, 1967, Riverside Church. Dr. King gave a speech against the Vietnam War. After that, Lyndon Bain Johnson did not talk to him. After that, Baynard Rustin came out supporting the war. After that, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP supported the war. The leader of the Urban League supported the war. After that, a lot of the white liberal support that he got came out against King. Of course, a lot of the moderate and, and African-American leaders that always thought he was too radical said, that's ridiculous. You're supposed to focus on civil rights. Don't worry about the war. That's how a lot of us get our jobs. We get paid. We go into the military. We serve. We get these nice houses, good jobs. We're accepted in society. 
But King spoke out against the war. He said, I cannot preach nonviolence here at home and support violence overseas in another country. <laughs> After the assassination of Malcolm X, the black radicals criticized him, called him an Uncle Tom. The black conservative said he was too radical. He lost support. Things were very, very difficult, spinning out of control. Every day was a struggle, but yet King had the strength to keep moving forward. I'm sure he remembered that there was something important to do, something he had to do as a little boy. He had to keep his eyes on the prize. He had a purpose in life something much bigger than himself. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white, all are precious in God's sight. He knew that the human family is a family, that we are not, not separated or segregated by anything. He did not fight against individuals. Dr. King fought against injustice. He fought against an unjust system that killed innocent people, that held people down, Red, brown, yellow, black, and white. And that's what made him dangerous. Because those who benefit from the system are rich, they're wealthy, they're connected, they're powerful. Don't rock that boat. When you speak against, against militarism, materialism, and racism, you're talking about three giant evils. When you speak about against the military industrial complex, you're talking about billions of dollars. Could you imagine the money that we spend on drones for killing, if we spent that money on drones for healing? Can you imagine if we took the money that we spent on prisons and put them in the building of our communities and, and making our schools better, what we could do? Can you imagine if we took DQ University and it's closed down, we have more Native Americans in this state than anywhere else in the nation. They only had one Native American indigenous community college, DQU, right outside of Davis, and it's closed. Can you imagine if UC Davis, with all of his resources, took DQU in the state and made it into a place that raised and served Native Americans, what it would do to our nation and our world? We have a lot of work to do. We're just beginning. What you need to know is that Jesus was a radical. Jesus was militant. Yeah, I know some of us like listen to Joel Olstein that you're all going to get rich and everything's going to be fine and no matter what happens to you, it's going to work out. If King had preached that sermon, he'd still be alive today. He'd have a big church bigger than Joel Osteen ever thought of. <laughs> Using words more eloquent than any other person ever born or, or, or dead ever had. And he would still be alive. But Jesus was hated. Jesus was a radical. Jesus was a militant. You didn't come to Jesus and all of a sudden, you know, you're feeling good. He was a rich man that came to Jesus. He was very, very rich. He said, I said, do you, do you love God with all your heart, soul, and, soul and strength? Are, are you serving? People said, yes, I do. Jesus looked at him and said, then one thing, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Jesus didn't make you comfortable. Jesus made you uncomfortable. He was a radical. He was a militant. The young rich man walked away because he was very, very rich. <laughs> now, if you... If Jesus was in there present sermon, that church would be empty after a while. He'd only be left with about 12 people. <laughs> That's all he would have, 12 people following him around. And some women, too, just a few. <laughs> but that's the message of the gospel. You know, religion is really about healing and bringing people together. It's not about killing. 
That's why I want to have a World Religions Day at UC Davis. We got to teach them that world religion is about bringing people up, not pushing them down, standing up for the poor, standing up for the oppressed, standing up for people who are struggling just to live. Two months before he died, February 4th, 1968, he preached his last sermon at Ebenezer Baptist Church. It's the famous sermon where he gave his eulogy. And he used the text of the scripture where James and John, Mark 10th, 35 through 45, and basically they came to Jesus saying, hey, Jesus, you know, we want to sit on your, your right side and, and left side. And uh, uh, Jesus looked at them. Dr. King called this sermon the drum major instinct. Jesus looked at them and said, you, you don't know what you're asking. They said, yes, we do. He, he said, are you able to, to drink from the cup that I'm going to drink from? Or not, are you able to suffer like I'm going to suffer? They said, yes, we will, Jesus. And Jesus looked at them and he said, you know, that's really not my decision. The seat on my right and the seat on my left are reserved for those who are willing to serve. Because the greatest of you must be the servant of all. And King said, that's a new definition of greatness. Because anybody can be great because anyone can serve. Yes, we want to be first. We want to have that drum major instinct. We want to lead the crowd. He said, that's a good instinct if you lose, use it right. It's okay to want to be first. But be first in love. Be first in justice. Be first in service. Because the greatest of you must be the servant of all. And then he went on to say, he said, if any one of you are around when I come to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. He said, if you ask them what I want them to say, tell them that I tried to feed the hungry. I tried to clothe the naked. I visited those who were sick and in prison. I tried to love and serve humanity. And that's all I want you to say. Because when Jesus was asked about the kingdom of heaven and getting to heaven, he told them a story, the parable of the final judgment of sheep and goats that were separated on the right and the left. He said, I'll tell those who are on my right, come unto me that to the kingdom, a place to prepare for you since the beginning of time. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. It's not how much money you had, how many degrees you had. It's not how many inventions you had, how famous you were. Did you help someone in need? It's not what color you are, what family you came from. Did you help someone in need? Did you make the world a better place? If you did, this is for you. Welcome into my kingdom. He kept his eyes on the prize. King said, injustice anywhere is, is a threat to justice everywhere. What did King want? What was his prize? King wanted justice. Malcolm X wanted justice. Fannie Lou Hamer wanted justice. Goodman, Swerner, and Cheney wanted justice. All the great people in the world want justice for all. Why? Because justice brings us peace. And peace brings us freedom. And freedom allows us to live a great life. And, and living a great life allows you to love. And the Bible said that God is love. I know one thing we did right, 
It was the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Work for peace. Fight for justice with love for all. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Malone. I hear, in, uh, I hear in your words the title of your sermon, which is that service has a, has a cost, service has a price. Um, I think when we serve from a place of privilege, and I acknowledge my privilege, we have to acknowledge our privilege. When I have served from a place of privilege, and I have done that, I confess, it's about me defining what you need and condescending to help you. But that's not what service is. Service has a cost. And the only way we're gonna serve in the way of Martin is to get down where people hurt, is to learn the way of brokenness, to walk with it. That's the way I wanna serve, and that's the way I hope our community will serve one another. So we're gonna conclude our program today. We're going to conclude our program today with folk music played by our ever popular Davis Freedom Singers, led by Dick Holdstock. Come on up, you can start making your way up. When they're done, everybody here is, is encouraged to participate in a short freedom march through downtown Davis. Thank you in advance to the Freedom Singers and thanks to each of you for joining us today to celebrate service. Bring your hands. Bring your heart, bring your feet, bring your arms, bring your gifts that together we might serve and in service honor the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King and continue his work. Thanks for coming. Okay, so uh, please come up and sing with us, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna sing zipper songs. That means that there's a, well, a line that keeps on repeating itself, and then uh, we just put another thing in there if we can think what to put in next. But listening to that wonderful talk, I want to start with "Oh Freedom," and uh, so "Oh Freedom." Now you get the idea. You're, Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over thee. And before I be your slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Justice, oh, justice, oh, justice, oh, I'll be for i be your slave, I'll be buried in my grave, and go home to my Lord, and Liberty.
song now. I'm on my way and I won't turn back. I'm on my way and I won't turn back. Well, I'm on my way and I won't turn back. I'm on my way. Thank God I'm on my way. Got to follow freedom. And I won't turn back. Gotta follow freedom. Gotta follow freedom. And I won't turn back. Gonna follow freedom. And I won't turn back. I'm on my way. Great God, I'm on my way. We're gonna go down the aisle. Singing this song, we want you to follow us out onto the street. Well, we're on our way. 